What is up everybody and welcome to what is likely to be my final new release review of 2023 in the Iron Claw, the latest biopic of the famed wrestling family, the Von Eriks. Now to set the stage properly, I am not a wrestling fan, never have been. The most interest that I've ever taken in the wrestling industry is whenever I was like a preteen and the WWF SmackDown games were really big, so games like Shut Your Mouth, and I played quite a bit of that back in the day, but that was the only real entry that I had into the wrestling industry. Never watched it, never really followed any of the wrestlers. I knew Stone Cold and The Rock were the big ones of the time whenever I was growing up, but I know little to nothing about the history of the industry, uh, some of the more famous wrestlers of the 80s and 90s outside of maybe like Hulk Hogan, some of those big names, Ric Flair, who's in this movie. So I knew nothing about the Von Erichs. In fact, I don't think I've ever even heard that name before until people started talking about this movie within the last month or so. So I walked into this one damn near completely blind about what the story was going to be regarding this family. I had already been giving a lot of clues that it was gonna be a pretty dramatic and heartbreaking and gut-wrenching experience, so I assumed a certain amount of tragedy, had no idea to the degree that tragedy was absolutely the word to use in regards to this family. And to be honest, I prefer that experience when it comes to biopics. Sometimes it's fun to see a, a movie adaptation of a band or a musical group or an artist that you like, but to me it's much more fascinating to learn about a story of somebody that you are not familiar with in a cinematic form because you don't have kind of a pre-established idea of those events. You don't pick apart some of the, the more fictional elements of the movie that they have to mold to make an effective script, which this absolutely does take certain liberties with the story and the family. If I'm able to walk in and just experience this story as if it's fictional and then come to find out that it's actually a true story, sometimes those are the best experiences with biopics and that was the experience with the Iron Claw. Starting off with the positives, this story was fascinating to me. As somebody who is not a wrestling fan, I was actually genuinely shocked how sucked in I was into seeing the events of this family transpire and seeing kind of the interworkings of how the wrestling federations used to be in the 70s and the 80s. You know, nowadays it's just WWE for the most part. It, I believe so. Maybe somebody will correct me down below and there's multiple ones, but WWE is the only one I've ever heard of for the last decade plus. And back in the 70s and 80s, it was like there was these different territories and Texas was owned by the Von Eriks. And even just aside from the family drama, which is certainly the biggest point of the movie, just seeing how the wrestling industry used to work and the things that you had to do to make a name for yourself and the steps that you had to go through to get a title shot or to earn the belt. You know, it's the worst kept secret in the world that wrestling is scripted. There's a lot of physicality. There's a lot of sportsmanship and, and, uh, and a lot of uh, athleticism that goes into it. So I would never use the word fake, but it's scripted. It's predetermined. You know, there, there's a lot of theater involved in it. And so I've always been curious of how does that work? You know, it's not like two big dudes go into a ring and they beat the shit out of each other and whoever's the strongest comes out with the belt. Somebody determines who's getting that belt and how does those decisions get made? And this movie certainly dives into some of that and all of the drama and the heartbreak that comes with waiting for your shot and what you have to do to prove to the higher ups, the people that make those decisions that this is your time. And a movie focusing on that would have been fascinating enough for me and certainly would have sucked me in for well over two hours, but then you add in all of the real life turmoil and tragedy of the Von Erich family. And my God, like devastating, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, heartbreaking. These are all words that you can throw out in regards to this story and you're still underselling it. And what I resonated with so much in this story is the themes of fatherhood and brotherhood. And the way that this movie explores the the goodness that comes out of family bonds and how close you are with family and how much family can be the, the biggest value in your life while simultaneously exploring how toxic and destructive that family ties and family expectations can be. 
So you have Fritz von Erich, who is the patriarch of this family, who is somebody that never really got his shot in the res wrestling industry, who has now put all of his hopes and dreams and expectations onto the shoulders of his sons. And they are the new era of the von Erichs in the late 70s and early 80s. And as somebody who is a father, that was such a palpable story and theme to explore in talking about the fine line between having expectations and wanting the best for your children and wanting them to have the things that you never had, wanting them to achieve the things that you could never achieve while never crossing the line into dumping all of your baggage onto them and living through them and putting them through hell to achieve what you never could for your own selfish reasons. And I think that there's probably so many examples throughout history, both in famous families and just everyday families where that line is crossed. And this movie shows that to one of the most devastating degrees that I've ever seen of just a group of children that their entire life is consumed with trying to measure up to their father's expectations to where nothing else in the world matters. And anything that gets in the way of that is devastating and it is something that has to be dealt with and focused on and obsessed over. And at the same time, when you're exploring through this, the perspective of the Von Erich brothers and how tight they are together and kind of almost trauma bonding because they all have those unrealistic expectations. Then they all have the burden of the Von Erich name on their shoulders as if it's all on them. Win or lose, it's up to them. And the way that that brings them together and that makes them so close to where they fight for each other, they defend each other, and all the way through the worst tragedies, they love each other. That was something that was just, as somebody who has four siblings, and I've always been very close with them, and you know, I have one of them that, that lives halfway across the country that I've only been able to see a number of times in the last 13 years, like seeing the most heartbreaking elements of that brotherhood really, really got to me emotionally. And as a film fan, I'm starting to get to the point to where you know, I, I love my, my blockbuster experiences. I love my mindless entertainment and action films and horror films and comic book films when they're done right. But more and more as I've gotten older and my tastes have matured and I'm experiencing many more films per year than I ever have before, especially over the last two years, a movie like The Iron Claw that can give me an experience that sticks with me emotionally and makes me walk away thinking about things and valuing things in my own life. And even a week outside of when I watched it, I'm still vividly picturing specific scenes and specific lines by the end of this film that just put a dagger in my heart. Those are the movie experiences that I'm starting to value a lot more. Performance-wise, everybody is top-notch here. You know, Zac Efron is the lead here playing Kevin Von Erich, very much kind of the emotional anchor of the family, the one who uh, handles the situation the best as far as just kind of accepting his fate as the one that needs to bring this home while his brothers are kind of all over the spectrum on that. And Zac Efron's one of those guys that, as a male, as the competitive nature of us comes out, he's one of those guys that you kind of want to hate because he's unbelievably good looking he's in ungodly shape you know he was the, the the poster boy back in the high school musical days and all of a sudden now he's in all these blockbuster movies or you know ones that could have been like Baywatch but nonetheless he's one of those guys where you're like you can't have everything you can't be an outstanding actor and look the way that you look and be a nice guy damn it you have to have some flaws but he doesn't seem to I mean I don't know the guy personally but everything I see of him with his work as an actor he continuously gets better, this being by far his best performance. Everything I've seen in interviews, he seems like a really cool down-to-earth guy. It's just like, God damn it, why are you so fucking cool? But nonetheless, Zac Efron, uh, that's a name that absolutely should be on the ballots this year for the Oscars. Because this movie came out so late in the year, I don't know if it will be, but if he is not, that is the performance of the year that you're going to hear everybody scream snub because he's outstanding here. There is a moment in the closing minutes of this movie that is the most devastating line delivery 
between him and two other characters that I've experienced in a number of years. Like I really get tired of kind of, I always call them movie review mad libs on Twitter where you get a lot of people, some of which are my friends and peers that just consistently say the same words in regards to every movie they see throughout the year. And one of the ones that I roll my eyes at the most is it broke me. This scene broke me. This performance broke me. This scene broke the fuck out of me. I'm still broke. Jeremy Allen White is the other standout to me, and had I not heard all of the hype for this movie that really kind of gained my interest to check it out, he would have been the selling point for me because I have been a massive fan of that guy ever since I got hooked into Shameless in its early seasons. Him and Emmy Rossum were always the powerhouses of that series, in my opinion, and it's been awesome to see his career continue past the ending of Shameless into shows like The Bear that is incredible, and everybody's been really digging it when when I first saw it, I would have assumed that would be like this quiet little cult show, and it absolutely has not been, and it's been great to see that. And then following it up with a performance like this, where there's not only just a physical transformation, where he is massive, but is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Zac Efron for the most emotional devastation you're going to see this year. But Holt Michelinie is also worth pointing out as the, the patriarch performance, as the one that you're kind of growing to hate throughout the movie as Fritz von Erich. I always call him Robert Paulson just because he's the one that delivers that line in Fight Club. I know Meatloaf is fucking Robert Paulson, Twitter. Thanks anyway, but he's great. You know, at the beginning of the movie, you kind of feel like you have a grasp on this character and you understand his wants and needs for his children and where they come from. And there's even some, some very self-aware, kind of darkly comedic lines that come out in the early parts of the film where he's discussing his son's accomplishments. And he's like, we all know that Carrie's my favorite, then it's Kevin, and then it's you, and then it's you, but the rankings can always change which I watched this with my father a day before Christmas Eve, and there's always this inside joke that I'm his favorite child, so we got a good laugh out of that. My sisters would come into the room, and they're like, hey, your favorite kid's here, and he's like, what, Cody's here? But as the movie goes on, the darkness just gradually cranks up with that character, and all of the things that you thought you sympathized with and you thought you understood, kind of the, the old school, determination of a father pushing his sons to greatness slowly starts to turn into this really sick and twisted obsession and his performance brings all that home. This is one of the best movie experiences that I've had all year. This is easily going to crack my top 10 of the year and I, I'm honestly seriously toying with putting it extremely high in that top 10 because uh, for the, the movie experiences that I typically hold in highest value at the end of the year, I don't quite feel that way about them in 2023. Things feel a little different this year. So we'll see when that video comes out, but Iron Claw, if, if any of this movie sounds appealing to you, uh, the wrestling history, uh, family drama, uh, really outstanding performances, I can't recommend it enough. Moving on to the mix, I have two things. They're both extremely small. First of all, it's the soundtrack. I think that, you know, being that it's the late 70s, early 80s, there is a lot of songs in this movie that people are going to love. There are a few sequences, one in particular with Rush's Tom Sawyer that I thought was used very well. The negative side of it is that me being a music snob, I feel like every movie that takes place in the 70s and 80s pull from the same 20 songs. So sometimes as a movie's soundtrack unfolds throughout the runtime, I'm like, can we listen to anything else but Don't Fear the Reaper? Does that have to be in every fucking movie? The other mixed element is really just gonna depend on whether you're walking into this movie with a pre-established knowledge of the events or not. There are one of the Von Erich brothers that are omitted from the movie version of this story. Story. And I was actually shocked to find that out because as soon as the credits rolled, I pulled out my phone, I started to look up everything I could to kind of flesh out more of the actual story. And I was shocked to find out there was yet another brother that had yet another tragic life. It was like, Jesus, it felt like this was way over the top without an additional brother. And I think that's the positive side of the screenwriter's decision to take two of the brothers and kind of mold them into one character, the younger brother of this group because I do feel like the section of the movie that focuses on the devastation and the tragedy of this family, it's so overwhelming by the end of it that if you would have had yet another character, I think it would have been too much, and it also would have risked being a bit redundant and a bit repetitive with the things that they're exploring. So from a pure movie-making standpoint, I think they made the right decision. 
but I could also understand somebody that is close to the family or somebody that is close to the story or people that are massive wrestling fans that are very much in the know about this story being frustrated that one of the members of the family is not featured. But overall, guys, I thought this was an outstanding movie that absolutely was not on my radar, and I'm glad that a lot of you put it on my radar because it's going to end up being one of my favorite movies of 2023. It's going to be one of the movies that I sing praises and I recommend to the most people in 2023. Uh, it's not for everybody. It's an emotionally devastating ride, so know whether or not your tolerance is enough for that, but if it is, and if you have interest in the story, you're going to be hard pressed to find a better dramatic experience with film in 2023. Well, that's it, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews, of which this should be the last one. Please like, share, hit that subscribe button so that you do not miss all of my end of the year list that are going to be coming over the next couple of weeks. we got a lot of movies to talk about, so don't miss out on that. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.